Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today is all about GMS drums. I'm joined by Rob Mazzella and Tony Galino. Rob and Tony, how are you guys? Hey, how you doing, Bart? We're good. Good, Bart. How are you, man? Good. Thanks for being here. So, uh, GMS is a drum brand that I have just always... I've never actually played a drum set or a snare, but I've seen GMS everywhere. I mean, very famous bands. They're, it's just regarded as one of like the best drum brands in the world and it's very i feel like you guys are kind of one of kind of an early boutique drum brand like that that boutique term sort of blew up obviously in the you know 2000s but you guys have been doing it for a long time over 30 years so um why don't we go back to the beginning and uh rob why don't you take it away all right um in the beginning uh we started in 1987 and um i it was it was really kind of innocent and we had both tony and i uh, had a um, mutual friend who owned a drum store in uh, long island in queens called the long island drum center and his name is tony fabiano and what I, my history was working on some um i was a machinist by trade and i was i was mm. mer- making some uh parts for drums and i w- always brought them into the store and I would show Tony Fabiano these parts. And he always told me, he said, you got to meet this guy, Tony Galino, because he works on drums. And I never really, the thought never crossed my mind of to what this was going to wind up being. It was just an innocent, you know, wow, I'd like to meet this guy. And then one day we were both in the store and Tony Fabiano introduced us. And we just hit it off. And I wound up going over to Tony's house and he said he had some plans on on. Um, some parts he wanted made and and I looked at it and as he's talking I'm like this could be kind of fun and you know it's not a matter of just making some parts and putting a drum together I said this could be um, a business actually and we just started doing it and then one thing led to another and then Tony Fabiano actually sold the first drum for us and uh, wow we didn't really even realize that there was a market out there it was more for fun and that's the way it started so that's fascinating so it was a different uh, you said that was in the 80s right yeah 1987 was the year okay so that was obviously a different time for drums were you guys making kind of like uh similar kits that you've always made or were i mean that was like power toms and double bass and, <laughs> and hair metal well it was typical of the era you know deep toms you know the bass drums were getting longer oh god don't get me started <laughs> But, um, you know, uh, it was, yeah, it was the time. I mean, it, snare drums, too. We were doing snare drums probably first. Mm, yeah. You know, um, but, yeah, of the time. If you look back on, you know, some of the pictures and stuff, it's uh, I'm like, oh, my God, we actually did this? <laughs> you know, uh, you're making these deep tumps. I, I can't tell you how many times now, like to this day, where I get people say, I need you to cut my drums down. And uh, oh, and yeah. I do. You know, why not? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Seems pretty obvious now. But so GMS, I get the Galino, uh, Mazella. What is the S? What does GMS stand for? Why don't you tell us that? Well, there was there was an S. And um, he was actually my neighbor. He was older. You know, he was probably like my father's age. You know, uh, but he was a drummer. Like in, in the day, you know, in the 30s or 40s or whatever. And, um, you know, he, he was, uh, <laughs> he was an interesting character, but, uh, you know, he was, he was involved kind of in the beginning. Um, okay. but, uh, that's, a, that's a long time ago. Now you guys, um, like, I think I started noticing GMS drums. Um, I was a kid, I was born in 90, but, um, when, <laughs> okay. like, so, yeah, so, all yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I started noticing you guys though, like in the music videos for a lot of like, like I guess you would call them '90s bands, like mm-hmm. uh, STP. Yeah. So, so you guys had some serious artists on your roster. How did you go about getting these people? I mean, you from starting out with, you know, pretty modest beginnings. How, how did it grow? That kind of grew organically, um, and, and really, I think one of the big. Uh, there were a couple big catalysts actually uh, there was a, an association we had uh, one of our first artists was a, a guy named Mark Zonder out in um, 
in California, and he had, who's at a band called Fate's Warning, but he also owned a, a rehearsal studio called Bill's Place. And Stone Temple Pilots was rehearsing at Bill's Place, and they played on Mark's drums, and Eric, he loved them, and uh, he set up his first meeting with us on, on their first tour. And they were in New York, and he took the train out um, to Long Island from New York City, and we've been friends ever since. And that's one of the relationships that, you know, it's, I guess it's one of our longest, you know, so. An another thing that kind of springboarded us into artists and uh, kind of more worldwide recognition was around, I think it was 1990, we, uh, we formed an association and a business partnership with um, Peisty Symbols the Pisces Symbol Company, and they started distri dis uh, distributing us uh, worldwide. Really? So that really blew us wow. up and, and gave us a lot of um, worldwide attention. How does that work? How does Pisces help distribute with a drum set? Would it just be like if, if, a, if a store carries Pisty, then they likely will then carry GMS? Or I've never heard of that. Uh, well, it's, it, it was a little complicated in some ways, but in other ways it was, again, kind of innocent. The guy who was running Peisty at the time was Eric Peisty, or still is, uh, but Eric saw something in us uh, that was unique. And uh, it, that, Bart, you got to understand the time. What we were doing was unique. It wasn't what it is yeah. today. And you, ha you had companies like your Ludwigs and Pearls and Tamas, and they were all over the place, but they were very stock, and there was nothing to set them apart from besides each other. And when we yeah. came in, we were, st we were doing things like matching custom colors and custom sizes. And it was very exciting. And Peisty saw what we were doing. We got th through to Eric through some, um, one of his actual um, employees saw us and, and recommended and we met and it, it was just kind of happened real quick. He saw what we were doing and he, he says, you know, I'd like to be part of this. And, and that's how hmm. that started. Man, that's interesting. I feel like uh, that's what it takes is is getting uh, that little extra help from somebody else. You know what I mean? To just get that that jump forward. And uh, and I think drums are really the word of mouth goes a long way because I mean, you guys obviously to this day have a very big roster of of drummers who who appreciate the quality of everything you do. Um, so I think people see that and go, you know, this is apparent. And uh, your snares are. Uh, of note i feel like a lot of people really like your snare drums as well so it's just attention to detail you know i, I always say it's it's not rocket science yeah they work yeah yeah very quality stuff um i know i've 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 picked up and held a couple gms snares at various stores and uh it just feels like very high quality stuff um so Okay, so you start in the 80s, you go through the 90s. Obviously, a lot of people are playing them. People seen Stone Temple Pilots, you know, on on MTV using GMS drums. That's got to be a huge boost in sales. Um, did you guys get overwhelmed at that phase at all or or what's your what's your shop like? Why don't you tell us about that? Like how is the production line? How does all that work? Well, that it it did it blew up real fast and when we first started, we, we both kind of quit our jobs and jumped into it. And we started in a small shop uh, with, you know, one or two guys helping us. And through the Pisces connection, it just kind of snowballed because now we, we go from a small shop getting a couple orders here and there to a whole sales team going out and hmm. and selling the product for us. And they were able to make uh, associations with stores and um, so it blew up real fast, and we went from a small shop in Hicksville, Long Island, to a larger shop in Farmingdale, and that's that's the shop we had for the longest time. How many employees do you guys have? I mean, these are you're hand making all of these drums, right? Like each drum set is put together by by a person here in Long Island, right? Yeah. So at the time, let's I guess t to make it relevant to as opposed to what it is now, but at the time like in the mid 90s when you know I would say that was was a peak, I would say we have about 8 or 9 employees. Hmm. So Man. and we were putting out one or two kits a day. So it was a good it was a good flow. Wow. Yeah. Which I mean like it's so funny to think compared to like you know pearl or something <laughs> like that's the difference i think with a, with a company like you 
where one or two kits a day, they're they're beautifully handcrafted, put together drum sets um, versus a company that's spitting out thousands a day. So I think that's what the attention to details, what people notice, like Tony was saying. Um, now, do you guys make your shells or what, what do you use for shells? No, we, we don't. Uh, we've always used Keller. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, shells, you know, because to gear up to make your shells, you know, it's a multi-million dollar yeah. uh, endeavor. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, why? Uh, because you might as well get someone who knows what they're doing, who makes a quality product. I, I You know, even at that time, I, I have to believe the only people that were making their own shells were the Asian companies, yeah. you know, the, the Japanese companies, uh, you know, the Pearls, the Tamas, and things like that, and the Yamahas, and who even, I don't even really know for sure, yeah. but any of the, uh, the the smaller American guys, you know, everybody was using Keller. There was another company called Jasper. Sure. They're out of business, you know, so you didn't have a lot of choices, really, unless yeah. you wanted to make your own, but, uh, you know, I, I'm diverting here. Yes. You, sure. No, we don't make our own shells. No, and, and I think um, it's interesting because, so I had Justin Owen on. We did an uh, episode uh, about Keller shells a while back, and, and I just think that Keller, I don't want to say it got a bad reputation because I think that there was that such a, a boom of like, there was all these boutique drum sets that came out in the mid-2000s, and I bought one. I have one, not going to name, name a brand, but it's Keller shells, and it sounds amazing, and Keller makes great no, stuff the, yeah they're fantastic you know they did get a bad rep because everybody, you know but it's and and leave that to the drum for them. yeah exactly. really i mean yeah. you know once that came about every so oh just another set of killer shells oh stop will you <laughs> well, you, you know, know what I mean, people just don't know what they're talking about right yeah. bart if you let me uh elaborate on what tony said and, and he's and yeah. he's right in a way it became a thing where a, there was articles of separation. The drum business turned into um, a lot of people now doing what we started doing. When we started doing it, there weren't a lot of people um, that were doing uh, making custom drums. But through Keller, I think what Keller did in a way, they went into a distribution of their shells, which made it available to more people. When we first started sure. doing it, we had to deal with Keller. We had certain amount of quantity we had to buy. We had so it was there was a, a hurdle to get over to actually doing what we did. But when Keller started distributing their sell shells through small uh, companies where people could just buy one, then you started seeing a lot of people become drum companies. So now all mm -hmm. of a sudden there were it went from just one or two or three or four to dozens to hundreds, which I believe today there probably are. So yeah, if that helped with a little of the history of, of that. No, it absolutely does. Because I know um, I had a misconception with Keller about it being like Keller spits out a million of the same drum shell. But I didn't realize that. No, they actually like, like, let's say, um, I think it was Gretsch at some point. They want the shell to be like this with this right. amount of plies and this like their custom shells being made from Keller, so you can get your own mold. And, and I've bought through one of the websites, like a Keller shell, and I put together my own snare. And it was not, if, if I saw the snare that I built, I wouldn't have bought it, <laughs> if that makes right. sense. I would have been like, wow, that looks cheap and, and crappy. So um, yeah, and, and I think people can go listen to that episode, but it's funny, because you said like, the, like Jasper went out of business. It's a tough business, but I know Keller, I didn't really realize that they make tons of stuff. They oh, make yeah. like, building stuff he said they made like platform shoes i mean they make like everything so well it's a big, big, it's a big company yeah they got yeah. five divisions <laughs> exactly wow anywho this isn't about keller right. but that's a good uh, <laughs> side note but would you guys say that all right so let's teach us kind of a little bit about the um the climate when you started with other custom drum builders like you said there was there was tama there was Pearl, there was Ludwig. Who else was doing sort of what you guys did? Because it had to be just a, f if a, if anyone, a couple other companies. Well, basically four, if you really think about it, it was us, Noble and Cooley, uh, yeah. Joe Montaneri, and uh, Billy, a pork pie. Okay. Yeah. Those are some great, that's great company. We and, and, and we all started about the same time. Noble and Cooley was earlier. Sure. Because I remember that. 
I remember when I was starting to just fool around with stuff, I, I, I took notice of them. Uh, Montaneri was doing it a little early, but us and, and Billy uh, over at Pork Pie was the exact same time. Yeah, because I, uh, it's funny you said that because I also equate, like, like Pork Pie, I, I equate him to seeing, like, old Primus music videos. And yeah, yeah, right, same, right, right, Tim, Tim Alexander, was that his exactly. name? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, Herb, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so it was a really neat time, I think. Um, obviously, it seems like that was a cool moment in time for, I mean, you guys are a part of something special, you know? It's, it's, you know, it's not you, like that anymore. We were all very friendly, you know? Uh, I, yeah. it's still to this day, you know, yeah. uh, we, uh, you know, I, I, I called, I called Jay, Jay, I'll call Jay Jones over at, no, Jay, I'm in a bind. You have like a 16 by 16 shell and he'll send it to me. You know, it's like that, nice. it, 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 but that's just that core. I call, you know, almost, a, you know, to, uh, to borrow another term, it was like the core four, you know, if you're a baseball fan, you know what I'm talking about <laughs> yeah. uh, with the Yankees. They called them the core four was the the players. Anyway, it was just, you know, still to this day, I, I, I have great relationships with all those people. That's great. And part of it might be, too, that it was pre-social media, pre-cell phone. It was pre, it was all, it was a little <laughs> bit more, um, it was just different, yep. you know. It was a totally different world. Where would your main market be? I mean, do you distribute and sell like globally, or do you find that that America is pretty much your biggest point of you know drummers? It's hard to say. I, I guess you would. Yes, America is is our biggest core. Uh, we've had a lot of sales in Europe, um, Canada. So it's it's those were our, I think our biggest uh, markets. You know, we had a uh, we have we still have a distributor in Switzerland who sells a lot of stuff. Uh, Sticks Music, Lionel, uh, he sells a lot of stuff for us still to this day. So it's you know it's um, I would say those are our major markets. Cool. Now people can obviously uh, they can still buy GMS stuff. What is the best way for people to do that if they want to you know go out and I mean it's still a boutique brand. So are are you in like? guitar centers and stuff or is that kind of just a luck luck thing that you might find a kit there or should they just go through the website the that that section of the business has changed tremendously and it was a time where where that's all we did was sell directly to stores but that has flip-flopped t tremendously sure. and today i would say um our sales are direct okay so cool. if somebody calls us and um they want to order a kit. That's the way we handle it on a custom um, per uh, order basis. Nice. That's awesome. Well, I feel like the whole world has kind of changed as uh, all of the big box stores are, are struggling across the world. So yeah. I'm sure that's uh, that's just the way it goes. The music business has changed. And, you know, we were very fortunate to hit it when we did. And I, I would say that was the last of the of the heyday of the drum business it was a lot, it was a very exciting time. Uh, there was a, there was a lot of great things going on, and I think it's all changed today because I think the musician has changed today. When we used to make drums, we did we actually did a lot of concert snare drums for orchestras. Oh, you know, cool. that was a business, and that was that was a um, I guess a prideful thing to be an orchestral percussionist, and it was a it was a, a job. You know, they 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 really wanted to be a a drummer yeah and that's changed now because i don't really see that anymore you know where it's a career huh that's interesting i wouldn't and i wouldn't really think of that um but you know i know with a lot of drum companies that's something that i'm not involved in that world and i sometimes forget that it's like oh yeah that's a massive part of the drum industry even marching something i was never i didn't go that route growing up i mean god of course that's a huge source of revenue for a lot of companies so oh, yeah that's that's interesting that 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 you're not seeing as much of that nowadays. Well, not anymore. You know, it's uh, um, you know, you have to be, uh, you got to get, you got to be lucky. You know, I mean, but that's always that's always been. But now more than ever, you got to be lucky to have a gig. You know, I I, uh, I can't tell you how many people I know. I mean, like guys who are really fine players are looking for gigs because they're not out there. Yeah, and uh, you know, forget about you know. It's like uh, you say, well, I'm a session drummer. I'll, I'll stop. Give me a break because this <laughs> everybody's a session drummer now because they everybody can oh record at home. You're you right. know what I'm talking about. As much as we love the technology, it's actually destroyed the business. Yeah, 
I can speak to that a little bit from a from a um, obviously from a drummer standpoint, but mainly from working as an audio engineer for my day job. Oh it, yeah, it has just made it absolutely. So, and honestly, too, the big thing that I've noticed is a lot of voiceover talent, um, which this isn't even drum related, but I think it's interesting. A lot of voiceover talent, absolutely, they can record themselves at home. So the need to go, and then they use these things called like voices one two three. Where you pay 200 bucks, you call in, you connect to them, they're at home, they record the voiceover, which is for your uh, company's, you know, explainer video. So that business has gone away. Um, well, drummers can, everyone can track at home. It's just different. Yeah, I, 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 I have a good friend who had three main rooms in New York City. You know, I mean, large yeah. rooms. He had one of the old hit factories. And he, he always, he, po he pointed to 9-11. He says, after 9-11, and I think it's just coincidental, he says, you know, the bottom fell out. It just fell out. Mm. He says he went from like, you know, a $2 million a year, he goes to 700000 He goes, and then it, it was gone. Well, look in New York. What's left? Are there, it, what's left? You know, mm. Avatar is now part of, part of Berkeley, right? I mean, there, there are no, there are very little, very few studios in one of, you know, in what was a music capital. Yeah, really. So that goes that goes to the to the point of like why we were making the instruments that we did because we kind of felt that we were making them for the the people who wanted the the quality to be above what the what the um, the the general brands were doing and that's what mm -hmm. separated us at the time where the, the our sound quality was better our construction was better uh, so the choices of colors and sizes uh, were tailored to the player. So that was a different thing than just um, just kind of mass producing things. Yeah, that's interesting. So what, in the world of boutique drums, what does make you guys uh, stand out, which obviously has been probably one of the factors that's made you be uh, be able to stay alive for so long? What, what makes GMS different? I think it was the the custom factor, uh, the the fact that th these drums turned out to be a sum of the parts that made them sound so good and look so good. And we did a lot of things that were um, not done at the time. Uh, like I remember uh, we were starting to spray lacquers and uh, use different kinds of paints and finishes, and we were able to to spray chrome flakes. With uh, with opaque color or translucent colors over them, uh, so they would really pop and shine, and cool. it really. I remember being one of the first companies out there that was doing that. Um, but also, I think one of the the things that stands out to me, Tone, and you could you could jump in if you want. Um, the Revolution snare drum was something else. It was something that nobody's ever done before, and it was a wooden wood shell. And we sprayed metal inside it, oh, and that cool. metal was either brass, uh, a bronze. Uh, we had a steel, copper, so there were, there aluminum. These, yeah, yep, copper, aluminum. But we had these different metals that we were able to spray inside, and it gave each one a different sound. Hmm. Man, that's it was I've called the Revolution snare drum. That's fascinating, man. So you would just get like liquefied metal, basically, then, and just apply it like that, like a paint. Well, it's yeah. a it's a process, you know. It's a whole process. It, it's actually powdered, and oh, uh, it, you know, it has. You have to put it in a vehicle to actually get it uh, on. I mean, the, it's it's pretty wild because it actually is metal. You know, when you come down to when you first spray it, it looks like hell. You know, it looks like camouflage paint or something. But <laughs> you have sure. to sand it and scrape it and buff it, and and then it's it's metal. It's cold to the touch. The whole bit. Man, so clearly you guys do some things to, uh, you know, innovate. Does anyone else did some? Did anyone else kind of steal your idea? Or are you the only people to really do that? I I haven't seen I, it. I don't think anybody's figured it out <laughs> <laughs> until this. Well, I've seen I've seen over the years that uh, some people try to take an actual piece of metal, like a sheet of metal, sure. and put it inside. To give it a different reflective sound, but mm. nobody's ever sprayed it and made it a part of the shell. Well, that's awesome that you guys can can do that and, and make things so uh, so innovative. Yeah, but our minds were always going, and, it, and all these different things that um, 
would would pop up. I mean, if I if you don't mind, I, I'd like to just say one more. Um, we were working with one of the guys that, in our shop was Pete Levine, and he had a, a concept too, uh, which we co- wound up calling a PVS snare drum, which was a perimeter venting system. Hmm. And we we actually had um, there were no holes on the outside of the shell uh, for the air to escape. But we we had the holes come out through the bottom bearing edge, and escape that yeah, way. Yeah, but but they were there were holes on on the side, but it, it didn't go. Yeah, just to, sorry uh, to clarify, it didn't go out through holes in the shell. The holes were in the ba- are in the bearing edge, and then they go out to the, through the shell. They come go through the bearing edge first, and then out. It's uh, jeez, you know, they'll take like. It was yeah, really unique, it, and it's a great, great drum. Sensitive. It's got. Uh, it's just a really. It's got a lot of impact. Almost like it. It almost like it's almost like a compressed sound. Right. Yeah. The whole column of air comes down and doesn't escape until it. It actually just uses the right. whole bottom head right. and then escapes. Man, I didn't know any of that. I didn't know. I knew your snares were very, you know, well known, and a lot of people really love them. Um, but. Clearly, you guys are doing. You're not just like complacent with. Okay, we've got a snare that people like, which I think is is a great thing. So you got to always move forward, and and uh, if you're not growing and moving forward, then you're you know you're not moving at all. You're going nowhere. So so no, that that's true. But uh, it's 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 hard to you know some sometimes things just happen or somebody does something like Rob said with with Pete. You know, I said, wow, this is really cool because it. it it's a it's a drum, you know. It's just so much you can do with it. Yeah. But uh, some sometimes it's a happy accidents. Uh, you know, you just don't know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't really say it before, but it. it so I I've always really liked your badge. I feel like it's it's pretty simple, but I've just always liked it. You know what I mean? It's it's very. Um, I feel like timeless and and it sticks out. So I think that's something that 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 should be noted. It's, you know, I can always see it. You can you can read it from the other side of the room and know what kind of drums they are, which is really cool. Um so <laughs> yeah. that's well, that's Tony that's Tony's concept. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, it's just you know, the the logo is simple. Everything is simple, but it's 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 pretty much unmistakable. Uh wait, well, funny thing. I was watching um a Miles Davis um you know, it was like a documentary on Miles Davis. Yeah. And there's a shot from a Montreux concert in 90, I think it was his last concert. And there's a GMS drum kit in there. I didn't tell you that. Wow. Far. I, I forgot. Wow. No. And it must That's have been, amazing. you know, well, at that time, you know, it's either Peisty or Lionel, or one of the Swiss connections, because it was in Montreux. And I was like, "Oh my God! Oh my! Look at that!" I was like, "It was, it was, it was blew my mind." I, I couldn't believe it. That's awesome. So, I watched yeah. that. Uh, I saw that documentary. That was good. I'll have to. I'll have to go back and watch it's, that. Part. It's, I, I was. It's at the end, you know, because it was. Yeah. Uh, so you know which one I'm talking about. Yeah, I do exactly. I was more yeah. focused on on him and his recovery and his health and all that. Oh, I mean, absolutely. That, yeah, me too. But like, you know, I happened to see it because I of course. the logo stuck out. I, I saw it immediately. Company. I was like, "Oh my God." <laughs> Wow, that's so cool. I'm sure you never get used to seeing your drums on huge stages with mega drummers. Well, that's got to never get old. The, the the funniest thing was the first time we ever saw him on TV. You remember that, Rob? Oh, yeah. It was... So, uh, <laughs> on, 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 yeah, here's, this is a throwback. Johnny Carson. That's how old it goes. Wow. And um, it was it was a, a some Russian Dixieland band. And Think about that, a Russian Dixieland I, band. <laughs> <laughs> of course, on cars. I actually have that somewhere. I'll have to find it. That's awesome. Cool. Man, you guys made it on Carson. That's huge. <laughs> well, I told you how old we are. Oh, man. Yeah, we're old. <laughs> now, you guys are great. This is this is awesome. Now, what would you guys recommend to people? I'm not saying this in a way to like, let's get some more competition out there. But do you think there's room right now? Like, you don't see too many brand, brand new drum companies that pop up that can last for... There's a couple that have been around for a while, but a lot of them come in and then they go away. Would you say to people who are thinking, I want to get into drum building, there's no hope, kid. Don't worry about it. Just go home. Or would you say, you know, what advice would you give to someone who has an interest in building drums? What I would say, yeah, 
it's it's hard because you, it depends on the person and what they want to accomplish. Uh, it depends on the level of what they think the drum business should be for them. If it's, I could tell you that it, what it's going to be is is a one off operation that's gonna you're going to sell a little bit here and a little bit there, and a lot of guys are very capable and can make some quality stuff, but can it support your family? Can it can it support you know employees? That's a whole different thing. So it really depends on what they want to do. Um, and the, I think the reason why they don't last that long is because you don't have that constant cash flow coming in, and eventually it catches up to you, and and you can't yeah. you can't operate. So do it for fun more than right. being a, a millionaire, right. obviously. Well, you, you, you're not getting rich in, in, in this business. I, I mean, at least I, I don't think so. I mean, unless you know you, you're ma- you have a major funding and uh, distribution, but I think that's as we said before, that's all changed. The thing is. Making drums is not hard, you know, as as a concept. All right. Yeah. But what we bring to the table, and it's, it's a lot of times guys will come to me and they say, "I oh, I want, I I need like this. I want a fat sounding snare drum. You know, I I want like an eight by fourteen or something like that." And I always and it's come to the point that my relationship with a lot of guys is now they'll say I want this sound and they'll just leave it at that because they trust that I have the expertise and the experience to make them what they want hmm. you know because the people sure. most people they read so much on the internet and they as with anything you know there's too much information and most of it's wrong yeah absolutely so you know it's like Dylan, Dylan will say I, I need this okay great and that's it he'll just leave it at that and and then I'll make him a drum, and he says it. it you nailed it. Just be. Yeah. I've done. I, I. How many drums have I made? I mean, even thousands. just me personally. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thousands. thousands. Tony Delino has, I would say, almost literally touched every drum that's ever come out of there. Mm. And yeah, which is great. I mean, that doesn't happen with other companies. There, there I don't think there's a more qualified uh, drum technician in the world. That this guy, whatever, like what he just said, wh- whatever they tell him, he makes it. If they have a certain sound in their head, he makes it happen, and he knows what he's, you know, he knows what he's doing. Well, I, I ask the right questions too. I'll say, all right, what do you want it to sound? Yeah. You know, oh, okay, all right, then fine. Just I said, just leave it to me, and I'll take it from there. You know, tell me what you think you want, but don't tell me how to make it. Yeah, sure. And and it's not an it's not an arrogance, you know. It, but it, you know, Rob knows me, and uh, you obviously don't. But you know, it, it's it's pretty comical at times because uh, you know <laughs> <laughs> people say, and they just look at my face, and I go, "Oh God, here we go again." <laughs> yeah, you know, so that's funny. Yeah, but 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 that's that's part of the relationships that that you know we have, you know, with customers. I I call them clients. Yeah. You know, we have clients. You know, guys who always come back. You know. I have one guy uh, out in the Midwest, and he's he's hysterical. Uh, Did you make anything new recently? I said, "Come on, Mike, <laughs> what do you want me to do?" I said, and he'll always say, "Well, I I need something like this," and he goes, "I know, I know. I'm not going to say anything else. You'll just make it for me, and I'll be very happy." <laughs> yeah. But he's learned. You know, it works. Yeah. If someone were to come to you and say, "Hey, I want a snare drum." How do you like people to come to you with like what what's use some give us an example what would they would say to you to get a particular oh, song? okay uh, you know I, I if they said you know I want something like really fat you know you know like you know a lot of just meat and potatoes I can understand that and then I can recommend something from that um, if they want something like really cranked up and th- that's a whole other thing. It'll, and there's a common, to, I believe there's a common misconception. People think uh, a deep snare drum is going to give you that fat sound, and it's it's totally wrong. It's mm-hmm. the other way around. If you want to get something that's really fat, you got to go narrower. You got to go shallower. You know, it, yeah. because the the chamber is just too big sometimes, and it it, it just doesn't translate. And it, why? I don't know. I I can't answer that. I just know that what works. Yeah. You know, bearing edge choices. You know, uh, the amount of lugs, the number of lugs on the drum. The, the more lugs you put on the drum, the, 
it does it, it it becomes a hard feel it doesn't have any goosh it has no uh, meat i mean personally yeah. i i can't touch anything over eight lugs i go crazy it just feels like a table to me more lugs and this is something i've always like i understand it but i want to hear it from like an expert f- such as yourself so can you explain in a little more detail the lug situation like if you have 10 so more lugs equals well, it's a hard it's a more. harder feel it's a harder feel okay. and why okay. I don't know. Maybe because there's more things adding tension to the head. Yeah. Like I said, I'm I'm not scientific about this. I just know that the first time I made it a drum, you know, when we first started out, every snare drum had ten lugs, unless it was like a thirteen, but like a fourteen inch snare drum, they all had ten lugs. Okay. Yeah. I made one with eight, and I went, "Oh my God, what the hell is that?" I couldn't believe the difference in the sound, the pitch, the feel. It was like, uh, it was an epiphany. I just couldn't, it, it blew my mind. And the funny thing was, I remember I bought that drum to Nam that year, and uh, a dealer from the Midwest, who was also a fine drummer, he hit it and he, and he looked at me and went, what the hell is that? And it was just an eight-lug drum with a little, you know, mm. it wasn't as sharp a bearing edge, whatever, but it was just, it was, and then, you know, I, I, I've, I realized that there were a lot of eight lug drums out there, you know, like from the fifties to see, sure. you know, whatever. Realized that you know they've been doing this for years, and I I just figured it out. You know, it was just one of yeah. those things. And uh, but you know, to to me, there's a there's a softer feel. You know, it has a little more give in the head, and um, it could tune it tension wise the same as like a ten lug drum, but it'll have a lower pitch. Gotcha. That's helpful. again scientifically. I can't tell you why physically, you know, with the physics of it. I don't know. Well, I think sometimes when things are too scientific, you know, it's not. It doesn't translate that well. You could say like on paper it's supposed to be like this, but a lot of times it's like, well, that doesn't feel the way it's supposed to. You know. Well, you know, lock everything to a grid. You know, exactly. Tell me what well, that feels well, there you like. go. That's a good. Uh, that's a great analogy because again, in the studio, everything is very tight, and by you lock it to the grid, he's talking about using it dead onto a metronome if you're recording drums and uh well if it's day if it's dance music you know sure. i get it yes but, exactly yeah. but it loses that feel of that kind of swing and well, of it course speeds up towards the chorus sure. and uh um and all that stuff so well that's you cool. can still play to a click and have a good feel absolutely sure yeah, but, but if you beat you detective know, it and... into a different subject <laughs> yeah anyway we digress <laughs> do you guys have any um cool stories of you know someone's you got to make a snare in 20 minutes because they're broke and there's 20,000 people waiting in, you know, in the audience or anything cool like that. Not that example, but <laughs> any cool stories? Uh, I have a lot of them. I don't know if you heard of the band of Spin Doctors, but Aaron Comis, great oh, yeah, drummer. Sure. Um, we made a kit for him to use at one of his concerts and we brought it to Jones Beach Theater um, to, to use that night. They set it up, they did sound check, but he kept hearing a buzz in it and all night long and and he actually told us about it and we were really um we really wanted to uh to make aaron happy and tony and i we went to we went to the show afterwards and we we took the drums back to the shop and we took them completely apart i don't remember what time we we worked on them till like four o'clock in the morning until we figured it out and and actually drove it to the next gig in new jersey for the next morning and it was just a little buzz coming from yeah, a lug it, or something. But well, we just <laughs> that, that was a crazy night. Well, that's funny. The to boot, yeah. it, it was it was about 110 degrees. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> it was in July, and out that shop that we our first big shop was the hottest place. It was hotter than hell. I mean, I, I, I it still blows my mind to this day how hot it was. It was like 107 in July. <laughs> yeah, you know we're working in this. <laughs> Uh, and but w- uh, we were working in the shop at night. It, we were oh, it was nuts. Man, that's passion though. But that's fun, you know. I mean, you can look back on no, it. Well, that wasn't like, fun, but the- <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? In part, okay, you know, we also fun. had another great thing. Um, James Brown wanted our, our kits, and that was oh yeah, yeah that oh. was so much fun. Wow. So we got a call. James Brown was rehearsing in California and at uh, Center Staging Studios. And the owner called me up and he goes, Rob, you're never going to believe this. James Brown needs drums for his 40th anniversary tour. He took every drum set here. He pulled the bass drum down from every one of them and he hit every one of them. And when he got to yours, he said, that's it. 
that's what I want. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> oh, my God. Right? So we wound up making him, He and we did a custom brown sparkle for him. And he had two drummers, and we actually delivered him to the Apollo Theater for his 40th anniversary tour, and we hung out with him. It was so, it was mind-blowing. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was something. I'll never forget that one. If you don't mind me telling a couple of stories, Bart. <laughs> um, Please do. I'm yeah. just reminiscing. You know, after we talked the other day, I was thinking... There was another band um, called Splendor who was playing. Uh, they were recording their first album up in Bearsville uh, Studios, and Todd Rundgren was the producer. Hmm. And I got a call from the drummer, um, and he he said, "You're never going to believe this." He goes, "They had rented the equipment um, all from Artie Smith, who was a drum technician in New York City." And he had a um, a cartage business where he would uh, have drums and amplifiers, and uh, but he was mostly known for drums, as far as I know. And Artie had sent up a GMS kit, and he had sent up about forty snare drums, and those snare drums were all kinds of old leadies and you know just your classic yeah. uh, go-to Gretsch snare drums and all kinds of stuff. And he made the drummer sit in the, the room and hit every snare drum and he narrowed it down to two and both of them were ours <laughs> which that, both. do you remember that town oh yeah Artie's collection I mean I saw Artie's collection it was unreal it was unreal yeah. I mean everything that you could possibly think of you know stuff that was rare what he, he had everything god that's got to make you feel good I mean that's like yeah. a that's a blind taste test there I'm sure it wasn't blind but but like I mean but, but the fact that it's two of them right. <laughs> goes to show that it's not like a one-off accident where one was just this amazing drum. That's so cool. Yeah, it was fun. Cool. Any other any other stories? So, some of the s- surreal things that have happened, uh, not necessarily be- because of the our drums that we made, but because of our position, allowed us to meet people that we would have never thought we would have met. Sure. But one of them, the, my favorite was like Carl Palmer. Oh yeah, and I remember. Yeah, but like, Carl Palmer start. He called us up, <laughs> and I remember one of the guys working for us. And this is like when we first started. He called us up, and and this is through the connection of Peisty. He called us up, and and my friend answered the phone, and uh, my friend Brian and goes, Rob, Carl Palmer's on the phone. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I never would have guessed, right? Uh. So we, we we struck up a conversation and we talked a couple of times, and he really had a certain sound that he wanted, or he had some ideas, and so we never materialized anything out of it. But I wound up running into him at a concert uh, at Jones Beach, and they were opening up for uh, Jethro Tell, I think. And yeah. he had his drum set set up, and I went over and said hi to him, and he was all excited. And he's like, "Rob, Rob, gotta check it out. Gotta see my the drum I'm telling you about." And he brings me out on stage. Now the audience is packed. They still had the the cover over the drum set. He picks up the cover, and Carl and I are, are cr- we're crawling on the floor underneath his this tarp and looking at his drums from underneath. And I'm just like looking over at him, like. You would in a million years. I would have never guessed I'd be with one of these drum guys, that oh. world famous class guy, Carl Palmer, and here I am next to him. I it just blew me away. That's so funny. You never know what's going to lead to what, and it's going to be just a connection. And uh, this is oh, yeah. so this is crazy. But like I interviewed Bill Cardwell of CNC recently, and he said that. Uh, Carl Palmer called him looking for a specific drum set, and that ended up being the very, it was Radio King esque drum set, but with his sizes, and it ended up being the very first CNC drum set. So, just you saying that is yeah. like this sort of like everything is kind of connected here, you know? Oh, sure. And it's funny with those guys too, and I could see it, you know, that, yeah. it, that he would call Bill or something because Carl. My experience with him is he he has very specific ideas and he loves drums yeah. and he loves talking about them and I think it turns him on to to you know to be around that you know so it's absolutely it was interesting yeah oh that's awesome no you're right though you uh, I've had the same experience with the podcast where I've been amazed at sometimes the connections that it's made with people who just I mean we're all nerds about it who like talking about drums and. 
it doesn't go away. <laughs> you know what I mean? The passion yeah. never goes away. I mean, you guys have been involved, Tony and Rob, you guys have both made thousands of drums, like you said. So it's like, I mean, I'm sure you still love working on drums and talking about drums, obviously. Yep. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it, it's been a great part of our lives, right, Tone? And, oh, sure. You know, both being drummers, but making an instrument that somebody else could appreciate, it, that's something special. Yeah, definitely. Now, why don't you guys tell people where they can find you if they'd want to check out your amazing drums and, um, you know, social media, the website, all that good stuff. Well, we have a um, our website is uh, gmsdrums.com. And you could send us an email through that, and uh, we'll call you, and and uh, we could discuss your drums. Uh, there's also the, the GMS Facebook page, and we have uh, Instagram. So we're all the social media. Uh, so that's that's the way to do it. Cool. So um, I also want to give a quick shout out to Dylan Wissing, who is uh, from GettingTheSound.com, who was on a previous episode about uh, funky drummer and recreating that sound, and he is who connected me with Rob and Tony and got this whole GMS episode together. So uh, big shout out to to Dylan. You guys you guys have known known him for a while, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Dylan goes way back. Yeah. I remember Dylan when he came to the shop, he was always a a, a, a guy who was he loves drums. He was he was curious about them and he played GMS and he he wanted to, to see the shop and he came to the factory one day and and he hung out for a day and we and saw how we made drums and we that man that was I would say over twenty years ago. Oh, uh, easy. I don't remember wow. the exact. No, year. it was. He, but he was playing with he was playing with Johnny Sacco at the time, and. Uh, huh. We've been friends ever since, and he's done a lot for us. No, he he he's great, man. You know. Well, he's another great ambassador of yours oh, out in the world. Nobody and, better. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, I want to thank you guys for coming on the show and uh, taking the time to talk with us. And um, and again, I think that everyone should keep an eye out for GMS and um, try to get your hands on some and uh, reach out to Rob and Tony if you would like a GMS drum set. So. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today, guys. Thanks, Bart. Appreciate it. Thank you, Bart. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.